Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Lewis. I'm the uh, acquisition chair for uh, uh, the acquisition research program at Naval Postgraduate School. I'd like you to welcome. I'd like to welcome you to day two of our three-day acquisition research symposium. Uh, yesterday, we heard inspirational words and substantive guidance from Ms. Stacy Cummings, President Rondeau, Todd Harrison, Peter Levine, Elaine McCusker, David Berto. Dyke, Dyke Weatherington, excuse me, Richard Burke, four student thesis teams and a host of acquisition luminaries and researchers. Tuesday's attendees asked tough probing questions and sparked spirited discussions. Well done. Today, we'll be hearing from Mr. Jay Stephanie, acting ASN RDA, Lieutenant General Thurgood, Lieutenant General Thomas Todd, Lieutenant General Michael Williamson, Brigadier General Sloan, Rear Admiral Doug Small, Major General Cameron Holt, Rear Admiral Lauren Selby, Jill Boward, plus several more esteemed acquisition leaders. I'll be introducing Mr. Stephanie in a few minutes, but first, I'd like to brag a bit about NPS's acquisition research program uh, that is bringing you this event these three days. Yesterday, I discussed DOD's new Acquisition Innovation Research Center, pronounced ERIC, uh, which includes NPS as one of its research associates. ARP is an active supporter of, supporter of ERIC, but I do want to make it clear that we are continuing to conduct NPS work in support of NPS research sponsors from all services and all activities. ERIC plans to fund five to seven research proposals a year, or correction, this year, where ARP supports over 100 NPS students and another 10 to 20 research proposals a year. NPS ARP has published over 428 technical reports, completed 323 student research projects through, through 236 research grants. We have over 3,200 acquisition documents in our document repository, representing completed work across 18 years of ARP-sponsored acquisition research. These include peer-reviewed faculty publications, as well as student papers and symposium presentations. Current ARP work in these areas include uh, leverage artificial intelligence to learn, optimize, and war game, laid low for Navy ships, cost-benefit analysis of commercial product lifecycle models of using digital tools for Navy ship acquisition, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and risk management, understanding their implementation in military systems acquisitions, and reducing program costs in a monopoly contracting environment, and assessing the best use of software money, uh, BA8 money. The Navy Postgraduate School Acquisition Research Program is an innovation agent for the Navy and for the department. Our research spans a full spectrum of acquisition from program management, contracting, industrial-based logistics, personnel management, training, and financial management and budgeting. Our faculty and student researchers are experts or graduate students on track to be experts in all of these are topics and in across all these areas of expertise. Over 100 students conduct thesis or degree granting project work in NPS's acquisition curricula, graduating about 50 every six months. All NPS ARP research thesis and project work is focused on uh, naval uh, and defense acquisition issues or in issues that direct, relate directly to naval acquisition management concerns. ARP contributors bring contact comprehensive expertise in subjects like transition to production, risk reduction, supply chain management, acquisition strategies, and PPBE budget planning, sustainment modeling and planning, personnel and training plans, cybersecurity planning and assessments, and program management in a transitional environment and organizing around outcomes, not programs. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker and our principal speaker for today, Mr. Jay Stephanie. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to call you Mr. Stephanie, uh, but I'll work on it. So, uh, so Jay uh, grew up in there. Mr. Stephanie grew up in the amphibious and auxiliary shipbuilding uh, world, and uh, in that world, there's a hierarchy in shipbuilding, as you might imagine. And amphibious and auxiliary ships sit at the bottom of the hierarchy. Okay, they get no money, they get no attention, and they get no time with leadership, which means you pretty much got to do everything with nothing. So uh, people like Mr. Stephanie that grew up in that world are the ultimate scrappers, the ultimate performers, because uh, they literally do everything with nothing. And uh, and that's Jay's uh, history. He succeeded at that. I think I picked you to be an SES, didn't I, way back when? I 
Yes, you did, sir. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yeah. So, so it's all your fault. Yeah. <laughs> I chose well, I see. <laughs> so uh, Jay was the uh, LPD-17 program manager uh, during a very difficult and challenging time. Uh, did well. Program has done well and uh, continues in production. So, uh, so uh, I measure people by... Uh, the uh, products they perform, they produce, and uh, and by that measure, uh, Jay is a, a superstar. Uh, became an SES in 2012. Uh, worked for me for four years as the executive director of PO Ships, and uh, since then has been promoted to the principal civilian deputy at ASNRDA. So the senior civilian acquisition. Uh, uh, leader in the Department of the Navy, and then with the administration change, uh, he's been uh, fleeted up to acting uh, ASNRDA. And uh, and as I said, he uh, he's great at doing everything with nothing, uh, which is a wonderful skill to have, particularly uh, these days. So uh, with that, uh, over to you, Jay, uh, Mr. Stephanie. And uh, for the audience, the way this works is uh, uh, he has some uh, remarks. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A tab. Uh, if you see questions you like, you can upvote them. Uh, that'll push them to the top of the queue. And, uh, and when Mr. Stephanie is done, I will go ahead and uh, ask the questions. And questions at the top of the queue, which means upvoted questions, uh, get first, uh, first tips. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, speak with us this morning. And uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dave. And again, I'll, I'll have trouble with uh, you know, Admiral Lewis. You're still Admiral Lewis to me, but uh, thank you, Dave, for, uh, for that warm welcome. And uh, for the rem memories of those LPD days, uh, the, for those in the acquisition world that know those awful words called non McCurdy, we can uh, we can reminisce about that sometime. But a you're both survivors of that. So thank you uh, for that memory. Also, I'd like to thank uh, President Mondo for, for hosting this event and for the entire acquisition research program team for setting up this virtual symposium. I know it, it wasn't easy. Uh, we'd love to be out there on the West Coast with you guys uh, doing this in person, but, but having a, uh, a virtual event, uh, my understanding is day one went very well, and I'm honored to be able to kick off day two uh, of, of this three-day event. And I do appreciate uh, you, you, you putting me in that uh, list of luminaries. I think that was the term you used, luminaries. So uh, I, I uh, I'm honored to be included in, uh, in that group. You really had a really good uh, a set of uh, leaders to speak to you yesterday. Um, this is a critical venue that brings together representatives from industry, academia, and the military, as, I, as you know, to, that share an interest in getting defense acquisition related research uh, right. And so that's why it's really important that we were able to do this uh, symposium this year. And for those on the West Coast, I've had a three hour head start on you. Uh, but I thank you for getting up early this morning and uh, and thank you for your attention and, and uh, hopefully that caffeine from the coffee will get in your system and we'll get lots of good questions later on. So uh, research is a foundation to uh, acquisition both in government and the private sector. Industry, as I think most of you know, typically has a larger share of resources to invest in re research than we do and they have more latitude to apply it. So the defense acquisition community often has a catch up in the, in the research, whether it's technology, technology research or business or uh, acquisition research, which is why gathering like this one are critically important. Yesterday, you heard Ms. Cummings and, uh, outline some of Secretary Austin's strategic guidance and priorities. I'm not gonna repeat them, but uh, she noted that the acquisition, uh, acquisition research touches all of them, especially the urgent need to innovate, modernize, maintain, and enhance our force readiness. She also made it clear we must look at, take a hard look at all of our programs to ensure our force has the right mix of current and future capabilities to address the challenges posed, excuse me, posed by our competitors. From a naval aspect, this means that we need to integrate all of our domain naval power to retain America's edge at sea. We need it now. We need to get, to get there, we must develop innovative systems, modern, modernize our legacy systems and rigorously apply our acquisition enterprise uh, to meet up with the operational requirements. This is what the CNO recently uh, addressed in his NAV plan, which I hope all of you have uh, had a chance to look at. Achieving this vision requires more than just building a bigger fleet. 
you also must weave it all together into modernized command and control nodes and networks across all domains. We are developing a robust naval operational architecture that integrates all the joint forces. And this depends on a rigorous alignment between the acquisition community, research and development community, and the sustainment community. At art, here within ASNRDA, within the uh, naval acquisition, uh, within, within the naval community, we are working to meet this enduring challenge of developing future capabilities that enable initiatives like the naval uh, arch uh, operational architecture, while also recapitalizing, modernizing, and sustaining the fleet we have now. Given the competition, we have to be able to do all this at a faster rate, while making the most of our available resources. And as time goes on, I expect that we will all see that those resources uh, become, let's say, more limited as we go forward. Focusing in on the uh, Department of Navy acquisition, our overall strategic objective remains the same, which is to deliver and sustain lethal warfighting capability using agility and innovation to enable those capabilities at the speed of relevance. Underscoring this is the need for affordability and for program and technical rigor. As some of you may have recently read in the press, the methods that Undersecretary Gertz has instituted continue to hold true for us, what he calls the four Ds. So I'll quickly re uh, refresh those for you, for those who have not uh, seen that or, or uh, heard those recently. So the four Ds, first delegation of decision-making to the lowest capable level. Second is uh, differentiating the work we do. Uh, making sure that each of us in, in the various levels of leadership in the government are doing that work which only we can do and that we are uh, differentiating the other work and, and delegating it. Also with our industry partners, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll put all the work into a single prime contract to do the entire program. Maybe that's not the best method. Maybe there are pieces of the work that are better able to be done by other organizations or uh, other activities. So those, uh, so uh, the next one is uh, digitizing, the third D, and of course digitizing is uh, critical to everything we do. Uh, in order to be, and I think we've learned that here in the COVID crisis over the last year, that by digitizing, um, we, we have been able to continue getting a lot of work done, sometimes even more efficiently than we did before the COVID crisis. And we need to continue that digitizing so that we can do the data analysis and the data mining that is, is gonna be critical going forward. And the fourth, but by no means the least uh, D is developing the workforce. And that's again why I'm happy to, to be here talking to you all today, um, de developing that workforce, uh, both the, the production workforce, the engineering workforce and the acquisition workforce. Since, uh, since taken over as the acting ASMRDA a little over three months ago, I've set five goals for our team uh, on the more tactical level for 2021, to position the Navy acquisition team for success. These are align and accelerate the R&D enterprise to focus on the future fight, develop an agile, inclusive, and diverse workforce, improve acquisition rigor and discipline, stabilize and transform the department's industrial base and supply chain, and, and finally institutionalize the sustainment of our weapons systems. We are organizing to do this from the top. In late 2000, uh, 2019, we upgraded the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for research development, tests, uh, research development, tests, and evaluation to oversee the entire Navy uh, and Marine Corps research and development enterprise. In this capacity, my current DAS and RD Cheney, Ms. Joan Johnson, has expansive responsibilities, including visibility across the entire research portfolio which includes uh, the warfare centers, uh, the labs, uh, universities that are affiliate and affiliated research centers like NPS. And so again, research and development typically is looking at, at uh, technology to support uh, future warfighting capability, but I, I'm really pushing that, that research and development also be looking at, at how we support our acquisition and how we support sustainment, since sustainment is typically roughly 70% of the cost of a program over its life. So I think those are neglected areas that we uh, need to put a little more focus on in the research and development area. Uh, we also have realigned the uh, ASNRDA organization a little bit so that the Chief of Naval Research 
uh, Admiral Lawrence Selby, who I think you'll hear from later today. So he can have, focus all of his attention on accelerating research initiatives across the enterprise, like rapid prototyping and experimentation. We stood up a new research development board, uh, which enables senior leadership oversight and monitoring of our research portfolio. It is chaired by myself, the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, and the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps. In fact, we just had our second meeting last week. And this goal of this is to align the research and development community's investment priorities within, and sorry, with the CNO and the Commandant's warfighting priorities for the mid and long term, both again, new technology, new capability, but also the ability to uh, better uh, provide the capability through acquisition and then sustain it once it's out in the fleet. All, of, all three parts have to come together. This board uh, is, does its mission by, invest, uh, by directing the investments and promising technologies and promising um, business systems. And with the appropriate oversight, this board is able, goal of this board is to able to avoid the valley of death that I think we all have dealt with when, when S&T or new technologies or new processes are brought in and, and they don't get into the mainstream and how do we get them across the valley of death into the mainstream. Another way we're increasing agility is by delegating authorities, as I mentioned earlier, to the lowest level of, of competent capability. Um, as, as Ms. Cummings, I think, mentioned yesterday, we also uh, cautioned against a one-size-fits-all approach to defense acquisition. Which, uh, so one good example of delegating authorities is allowing our naval warfare centers and our system commands to use other methods of procurement uh, or other trans, uh, transactional authorities as opposed to the normal standard FAR processes. So that's one example. These allow our programmatic and technical workforce to work across a broader range of companies, the non-traditional companies you might hear about. Um, as, as many of you know, some of these authorities have been around since the mid-1990s, but others have just recently implemented, and they allow us to uh, procure supplies for research in, uh, domestic and abroad, as well as offer things like cash prizes. Uh, we recognize outstanding achievements uh, in both applied and, and uh, advanced research. We are seeing the benefits from using these authorities to work with companies to develop prototypes rapidly and test out those with the fleet. Uh, an example, in it, just last month, the Third Fleet and the Office, uh, the Navy's Office of Naval Research wrapped up the Integrated Battle Problem 21 exercise off the coast of California that evaluated 30 new technologies uh, and also looked at how we would actually use those technologies in the warfighter's hands. Uh, unmanned systems were a big part of that integrated battle problem 21, just reflecting the critical role that these platforms will play in, in the all domain integrated force of the future. While industry research in unmanned systems is highly advanced in commercial applications, you know, think Uber or you know, Amazon, something like that, there isn't as much out there to fulfill unique naval requirements. So for this audience especially, that means unmanned systems research represents a tremendous growth area. And again, not just in the technology, but how we employ that, te that technology, how we use that to make uh, the unmanned technology and the autonomy that can go with that to make all of our uh, processes more effective. Hopefully many of you, uh, hopefully all of you by now have seen the uh, unmanned cam campaign plan that the Department of Navy released in March which outlines how the Navy and Marine Corps will develop and field smaller pl platforms that operate in a more diver uh, dispersed way and keep pace with our comp uh, competitors. Mindful of past acquisition challenges, we are taking a systematic approach based on an iterative development proven process uh, that we've done over time, Aegis uh, program being a good example, where you build a little, test a little, and learn a lot. That is the mantra of our um, what we're trying to put in place for as we bring unmanned systems into, into our fleet as part of the manned unmanned team. We're continuing to adapt and scale mature technologies uh, for these unique uh, naval requirements. And we're increasing prototyping and experimenting to de-risk de technological development as well as established con ops. And frankly, this case address both legal and, and uh, greater policy, international policy issues that would go with unmanned systems or autonomous systems. We are developing land-based test sites to reduce the risk before scaling production. And finally, we're applying feedback from that testing and from fleet exercises at both the platform system and subsystem levels. 
We are also em embracing new ways of thinking about uh, things like digital engineering, DevSecOps, and artificial intelligence. While I could spend probably like all day talking about these areas, I do want to highlight uh, specifically digital engineering not just in terms of what it delivers to the warfighter, but applying the principles of it to any point throughout the acquisition life cycle. By definition, digital engineering uses models and authoritative data to coordinate and integrate all disciplines and all phases of work for the life cycle of a program or a system. It moves away from you know, tech manuals and paper and, and mechanical upgrades and moves toward a network digital, of digital information and software development. It manifests in the form of digital lakes, and, oh, sorry, digital twins and data lakes that allow us to test new systems in real time and model scenarios that were unheard of years ago. That has obvious values for the warfighter and from the uh, operation perspective, think the, the uh, NOA or the uh, project overmatch that I mentioned before. Uh, but again, 70% of our money goes to sustainment. So I really wanna look at, at uh, how we use digital engineering throughout the life cycle. From that perspective, we need to apply a digital, uh, I'm sorry, for, that, for an example, in an ideal world, a single digital model could be used for the program's requirements definition phase. Then we use that same model for the 3D design. Uh, and then it moves into the digital uh, production phase where and that same model, that same data, this uh, moves into digital production. We then use it for developmental testing. And ideally we even use it for operational testing. Like obviously we have worked with the OTE make that happen, but why, why wouldn't we use the same models uh, for operational testing? Then operator training and main, maintainer training, again, should be the same single model thread, digital thread, and ultimately for life cycle sustainment and modernization. We need the combined efforts of all of you on this, on this uh, Zoom session in this symposium to figure out how to turn that single thread for the life cycle of a program into a reality. As we've started our journey with OSD on the six paths of agile acquisition, which you heard about yesterday, we have the opportunity for the acquisition and sustainment community to do research on better innovative and innovative ways to use these new authorities and directives. The overarching goal is to do business with a minimal amount of friction, reducing bureaucracy, maintaining a reasonable checker to do a ratio, and above all, free up our brightest minds to do what they do best, to innovate. Some areas that come to mind for further explanation, uh, exploration from my perspective, um, like I mentioned before, the maintenance and sustainment world, how do we, how do we get uh, both uh, science and technology, technology, but also practices and, and, and focus uh, those on how to, on maintaining and sustaining our programs better. Again, move, move some of the focus away from uh, new capability, new technology capability and more into into maintenance and sustainment. Uh, CIBR, small business innovative research programs, how can we make those uh, generally the ones uh, related to sustainment don't get the uh, higher priority. We need to kind of boost the priority of those and, and put some focus on those. Let small business figure out how to help, how, how to help us do our business better. Uh, we need to build uh, you know, a buzzword of the day, build and operate sandboxes where we bring industry, government and academia together, particularly the non-traditional industry. Um, not sure how that actually works. I mean, I, and everybody talks about it. So some research and how we would practically apply this, the sandbox concepts and bring the right people together in the right manner to make that happen. I, I think there's a huge uh, opportunity there. I just, I'm not sure how we do it. So I'm looking for some research and how we, how we actually make that happen. Uh, additive manufacturing on plat, uh, for platform acquisition and sustainment. And again, we, we've hit little pockets here and there in the department maybe. Uh, 3D printing and other aspects of, of additive manufacture. But what we haven't done is brought it to scale. There is a huge opportunity here, but we have to figure out how to scale it so it is you, that we use additive manufacture, manufacturing as part of our normal processes in the acquisition and sustainment world. And great opportunity for somebody, some folks to research in that. And then the business model, right? Uh, intellectual property. We, we need to have the intellectual property to put into the added manufacturing models to be able to, to do this uh, scaled uh, capability. But we, we wanna make sure that we are taking care of our business partners. So there's, got, there's a business model here that, that I know exists. 
how do we find that business model where industry, uh, its intellectual property is protected, yet we are able to uh, go to scale, particularly in sustainment of our uh, using additive manufacturing 3D, what people call 3D printing. Um, so again, Larry, I'm, I'm really interested in how we do that. Uh, cybersecurity, we, we, we package cybersecurity at the end of a program, usually tack it on. And, and uh, so how do we bake it in from a program up front or multiple programs, a family of programs up front? And then how do we streamline the entire process of understanding the risk in cybersecurity? Um, again, if any of you have a good idea there, I'm happy to, to take that. Uh, and then we also have done, um, some of you know, we have uh, put it together a networking kind of approach. Uh, Naval X is what we kind of term it. And, and uh, we've set up tech bridges around the United States. And, and in particular, there's one in the United Kingdom, which are outside the firewalls of the government networks. And the idea is to enable and promote free flowing ideas and information you know, between the non traditional industry folks, ones we don't normally work with, academia, and of course, the Navy Marine Corps team. Now that that network's in place, hopefully you guys are aware that it's out there. Uh, it's not there to develop technology or to implement new business process. It's there to communicate and be the glue that brings it all together. So I, I'm interested in how you guys would see using that network, using that all those tech bridges to, to bring that uh, folks that are not normally in our, in our world into our world. Uh, even ideally, if we could figure out how to get some Wall Street kind of investment uh, into our world, that would be really, really helpful. So that's a, another area that so, um, I think we have the, the network in place. Now we need to figure out how to use it to our advantage. The last area I'd like to talk about is acquisition workforce development. Uh, acquisition depends, of course, on leaders, um, scientists, and engineers to develop, field, and sustain our ships, our aircraft, vehicles, networks, and weapons. Meeting the department's unique naval requirements means our projects must compete for time and attention of our of the top, uh, both leadership and, and engineers and scientists. That's why it's so important to invest heavily in the acquisition workforce we have today, as well as the one we want to recruit for tomorrow. We're addressing the first part of this through ed educational opportunities at DAU, at maybe postgraduate school, uh, and also executive leadership uh, development courses at civilian institutions like the University of North Carolina and the University of Virginia. Credentialing programs also provide a new type, uh, new types of professional incentives beyond this, the traditional certification, you know, check the block certification process. While public private exchanges uh, that allow naval acquisition professionals to understand their commercial counterparts better and vice versa is something we really do need to expand. Promoting naval science, technology, engineering, and mathematics opportunities in high school, undergraduate, and graduate students is another way we're trying to inspire future naval research. For those who are in the NPS acquisition research program now, your thesis and your research programs provide the department incredible value. I look forward to learning more about them as we go forward. So now that we have a little time to to catch up on uh, East Coast time zone and have, have a little more of that coffee get into your system. I'd like to stop there and frankly hear what's on your mind. So with that, turn it over to back to you, Dave. Uh, hopefully you've got some good questions in from the, the gang out there and I look forward to answering them. Uh, yes, we do as a matter of fact, got a couple of questions. So let me uh, start out a question from Michael Schwinn. Uh, with the years of experience that the OEMs have with digital engineering, how will the Navy proceed to leverage the OEM's digital twins, not only on the front end, but especially on the sustainment side? Would the Navy be interested in a joint industry Navy collaboration effort? Yes, yeah, so, so, uh, so definitely interested in, in the collaboration with the OEMs. Uh, actually, we've had, I, I, I get to see a uh, Pretty much every one of the major companies come in and tell, tell me, you know, we got this great digital uh, model. We've been doing it for years. It's awesome. And uh, as for my very first question is, okay, when can we, when can we see that and work together with you, bring our warfare centers or our research folks in, um, the program offices in, and, 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 ha and have a collaborative digital environment as opposed to a, uh, you know, here's my Northrop way or my Lockheed way or my Boeing way. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly the conversation. I know Ms. Cummings is having it at the DOD level with the CEOs of the, of the corporations, and I'm having it at the, at the next level down. Um, 
I don't know that all the companies, all the OEMs have the environments maybe that they brag about, but they have, they are going that way. And I, I really, it is a major effort at, at my part. And, I, and actually we've gotten um, at, the, at the president, vice president of these companies level. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to have you involved. And, and, and both of us, you know, all of us working together in that environment. Um, but then the doubles and the details, right? And the contracts and the legal and the, the data rights and all those kind of things. So work to be done, but yes, that is my goal is to is not to reinvent the will. If, if, uh, if the OEM already has a model or they're developing a model, we should be able to be in the middle of that working with them in it. And we just need the right licenses, the right authorities and uh, look forward to making that happen. Okay, so Pamela Kowal Schwartout has a similar question, almost the same. So I'll ask you the question. I think you answered it, but I'll give you another shot at it. Okay. Uh, how will the DOD receive buy-in from defense contracts to implement digital engineering mindset and relinquish control of OEM ownership, such as intellectual property, configuration management, diminishing resources, uh, MRB, and such? Uh, I think you touched right. on it. But, uh, so, so there. Well, so, so I'll, I'll go a little bit further. So, uh, so one there's the cooperative at the at the at the top leadership level, and 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 uh, sometimes I think we, the Navy, will come in and say, you know, or the you know Army or Air Force will come in and say, hey, industry, we want all your data rights. We want we want to take ownership of your of your data environment, right? And so, uh, so that doesn't work, right? Then then the shields go up and all that. And we, we get the lawyers involved. Um, so part one is it needs, we approach it as a collaborative, it, you still, you OEM still own that environment. We just want to be in it. We want to use it. We want to have access to it through acquisition. And then we want to be able to access it as we go into sustainment um, and, and be able to use the environment to sustain our own ships and airplanes and, and weapon systems. We don't want to go try to you know, resell yourself in the you know, international market or anything, but we want we want to be able to at least use that data environment to sustain so our own sailors and our own Marines can sustain the, the equipment we've given them. And actually at the, at the company's presidents and, and, uh, and the CEO level, they're all on board with that. They actually, they, 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 their concern is if, you know, third party gets a hold of it and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they're, they don't really have a problem, at least what they're telling us with, yeah, you sailors, Marines, you guys want to use it or go in naval shipyards or, Aviation depots, that's fine. It's it's the third parties we worry about. So that's part one. Part two is we are actually working with the Senate Armed Services Committee and the House Armed Services Committee. I just had meetings last with, week with them on how to craft some language that gives us those authorities I just mentioned for the sailors and Marines and the government to use for sustaining the systems um, but still protect the data rights over all of the OEM. So I just wanted to share that that's a, that's a very... Um, hot topic with the with Congress right now with industry and we are working uh, right now to figure that part out. Um, so so I think there's a compromise in there somewhere as long as we don't come in and, and, and try to do the hey we're the government we demand everything. Um, if, if we're making a this is what we actually need to maintain these systems I think we'll be okay. Um, but it but it in the end if they've created it you know they do own it and so we uh, we want to get to that shared environment. So do you envision, this is me talking now, do you envision some sort of a uh, uh, pallet or, uh, or cafeteria style of authorities or something where uh, a company can choose uh, column A or column B or column C, depending on how much they want to share or how much we want to share, uh, kind of pre-negotiated or pre-defined, or are you more custom with each company? A custom arrangement, company to company to company. Over. Yeah, I, I think it, it needs to be uh, both the company and the uh, and whatever it is we're trying to do. Right, our, our our model for for maintaining ships is different than our model for maintaining airplanes, which is different than our model for maintaining armored vehicles. Right, so so there has to be some customization. But I, but what I don't want to do is a company to come in and say, you know, here's 32 choices. Right, we we, we want to have a we want to have some overall guidance that kind of like I just, just yeah. talked about, right? Yeah. We need to have the information we need for our sailors and Marines to maintain and, and airmen and, uh, sorry, I don't know what Space Force people are called, but uh, for, for all- Guardians, for, they are guardians. I don't guardians, know. okay, Space Force <laughs> guardians to be able to sustain, uh, to, to operate and sustain the, that equipment. So, okay. so we need to put some guidelines in 
We're going to get high level, hopefully, from the from the Congress. I think we need to put out in all of our RFPs and all of our uh, contracts a certain level. And then, yes, I want industry to come back and say and, and prove to us where if there is something that yep, I, you can't have that government. But why can't I have it? What what is it that's you know the special sauce? What is really in there as opposed to I just stamped everything proprietary. You can't touch anything. So get a dialogue going is the key, right? This is what we want to do. This is what you want to do. Let's have that dialogue. So it will be, um, if not contract specific, probably company specific and domain specific. Okay. Uh, another question for me. Uh, we do have a Naval IX uh, established here at NPS. Uh, I think it's called Central Coast. Um, we're struggling with some of the contracting particulars, so it would be nice. Uh, this is an action item. Uh, it'd be nice if. Uh, Wait a minute, you're not allowed to give me action. <laughs> like back days, right? our, uh, but it would be nice to have some templates for Naval IX kind of activities. Uh, we're struggling uh, between our lawyers, O and R lawyers, and, uh, and other other attorneys on, you know, how, how, what is, where are the the hard bright lines around innovation in the naval IX environment, given that it's it's kind of outside the the DoD acquisition environment. So we're we're struggling with that. So just uh, just so you know. oh, thank you. I, that's that you know that to my point earlier. You know, I, I think we put it in there, and now we have to figure out how to use it. Part of figuring out how to use it is how to contract with it, how to do the legal parts. Uh, we purposely put it outside the normal government process. That's okay. good and bad. Like you're finding some of the bad of it. So but I want to get to the where you get the good out of it. So okay. Just, and actually, this question from uh, Ray Jones, a, a faculty member here, is a good one. Uh, developing innovative strategies, and, and it's along the line of the discussion we just had, developing innovative strategies between DOD and commercial industry and financial institutions requires innovative acquisition leaders and legal experts. Too often, innovative strategies are muted due to legal debate. What is the Navy doing to integrate the legal community into the dynamic and innovative acquisition environment to facilitate these innovative approaches? Over. Yeah, so that's the, uh, the the doer to reviewer ratio I was talking about earlier. Uh, but uh, I, I will say um, uh, we, we have... Working for me on my staff uh, is a very is probably the most innovative lawyer I've ever you know had the chance to work with a guy named Tom Frankfurt, yep. and so uh, when things get uh, up to his level, he's very good at getting you know to that innovative answer that that works for all of us. Now again, he's he's one guy. The acquisition community is very very large, lots of lawyers in, in there, and then uh, frankly the then we got the DoD lawyers, and then we got the you know, congressional lawyers. So. Um, no easy answer, except uh, if you have a great idea and you have innovation and the, the message from me uh, through Mr. Frankfurt down to the, to, the, to the legal community at the CISCOMs, at ONR, at, at uh, all the warfare centers, the message is get to yes, figure out a way to get to yes. Uh, and so that message, I'm, I'm happy to repeat it here. Uh, so all you hear it. So when a lawyer tells you no, then the answer is no, lawyers aren't supposed my view is lawyers don't tell us no. Uh, they may do, the answer is yes, but, but you have to do some, you know, whatever the but part is, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's where then, then leadership can say, yep, okay, now I'll recognize the risk. Maybe I still won't do it because of the risk, but at least I know it's possible. So, so if you take that, yes, if you do this or yes, but, but for these, you know, caveats, yeah. um, at the top of that acquisition legal world, it's all about it's all about supporting innovation and doing whatever within. If it's not written explicitly in statute, then we can do it. So let's okay. go figure out how to do it. Excellent. Well, maybe Tom can take a look at the Naval IX discussion. I just uh, I'm sure that was, <laughs> that's who I gave that action to them and Cindy Shear. So uh, Eric Bryan has a question. Was the oh here we go? Was the Battle Twenty One exercise you mentioned double? as a way to integrate warfighters into the acquisition process. I would love to hear more about your experience with the sailors and Marines and how they, the frontline end users could impact acquisitions moving forward. Over. Yes, that's, that's a great question. And, and that is, um, in this particular case, that is exactly why we had third fleet leading it. It wasn't a ONR led exercise, so third fleet led it. And we, and we actually 
that out and wanted to have you know the, the deck plates, sailors and marines actually operating uh, the manned and unmanned combinations. Uh, and, and so a lot of feedback from that. I, uh, I don't have like a detailed action ap ac uh, after action report, uh, it's coming out. But most of the feedback was actually not so much that the technology did what it was supposed to do, but we learned how to use it differently. We thought it could do that. We tried it. We found out a better way to do it. And we learned a lot about how to, uh, you know, we, the, the goals of, of communicating, be able to, you know, hit, hit a target, you know, hundreds of miles away with a, with a missile through unmanned and manned combinations. All, you know, all the, those objectives were met, but the real value that I saw coming back in the in the quick looks and the and the quick action after, uh, after action reports was th this way of operating unmanned v uh, vessels with manned vessels, uh, both undersea and uh, on surface, um, didn't really work out exactly like we thought. We but we learned better ways. And so, so how we get that? Maybe Dave, maybe you guys can be a a uh, you know, promulgator. Once we get the those reports out, uh, we can we can get it out to you. And uh, you can you can spread it to the larger community, and then we can hook up the, you know, what I want to do is is have whoever you know whoever answered asked the question and anybody else interested, actually go to to uh, to see the Marines at Camp Pendleton or go see the sailors down at San Diego and and actually talk to them. I mean, that's we can write reports, but the face to face is what really matters. I think feedback is very, very positive that the uh, deck plate sailors and Marines really got a lot on how they're going to actually use this in the future, which is our goal. Excellent, excellent. Let me get back up here. So uh, Bob Morlock, a professor here, uh, has a question. With a commitment to the acquisition workforce, is ASNRDA and the Navy Datum Office considering any initiatives or additional investments for more opportunities in graduate education in the acquisition sciences? Yeah, so, uh, so the answer is an easy, of course, yes. But then there's the budget, right? And so if it's if it's um, financing scholarships and and uh, if that's kind of the question or or sponsoring more folks in in uh, in programs, um, we, the, like with the rest of the Department of Defense, the, the top line is not going up in the future. If anything, it's it's uh, going to stay probably a little below inflation at the best. So there won't be more money. But what we will do is we talked about a, a moment ago or, or earlier in my presentation, um, some of the exchange programs, you know, send people to industry, send people to, uh, to a, a university or, or um, um, you know, NPS or whatever to, to learn and move people around. We can do that for very little money. And I, and I want to expand that kind of stuff. Um, I would love to spend, expand the number of scholarships and things like that, but Money's just not going to be there to do all of that. So I just want to be realistic. But the ability to send folks on rotation, rotations or uh, experiential learning opportunities, I think is the term, that the uh, education world, you know, hopefully I said that right. Uh, that's what I want to expand. I want people moving around, learning uh, from new, you know, experiencing new environments, working with folks they don't normally work with and learning uh, through that process. So how do we move people from, traditional uh, you know, program offices and warfare centers to academic institutions to industry, you know, that try it and move people around among the three. I, I really want to expand that. Well, uh, NPS and other schools, uh, NPS in particular has a pretty robust uh, distance learning program where individuals don't have to actually PCS to, to moderate. They can uh, do a lot of work from their, from their office or from their home. But they, they'll miss all those beautiful flowers behind you. Yeah. You have to pay. <laughs> Question from John Camp uh, from George Washington University. Uh, R&D is treated as a service. There is a trend for acquisition buying capabilities as services, cloud, lease platforms, et cetera, muddying the difference between development and production. How do you see the distinction between products and services evolving? Yeah, as we, as we move, as we move to uh, you know software of a service or, or those kind of uh, ideas, uh, I, I I do think that's where we need to go. We got you know uh, platforms right, and and we need the idea of the the divorcing, divorcing, separating sorry separating <laughs> applications and software from the from the platforms they run on uh, is actually the way of, of the future. That's what we have to do. Uh, ideally. Uh, 
what we will be able to do is move the money in the same way, right? Right now, right, you know, you've got R and D money, you can't use that for 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 uh, production. You can't use production money to do sustainment and all that. So there are some prototype um, business processes funding. Uh, there's an R and D a BA a BA eight concept where uh, where one color of money, in essence, can do R and D uh, production and sustainment at once in the software world. So you can you know, bring the new ideas, bring the fleet impact, bring the, the things that don't work all together and solve it in one software effort instead of multiple, you know, oh, I can't do that yet. I have to have a, you know, a sustainment build and then a separate, you know, new, new technology build in my software. So trying to figure out the financial part, but I think there's uh, an opportunity to, to get to that. Uh, the, the new software pathway, I, I really, uh, I don't, I think we only have one program in it, the Department of Navy so far. Want to explore that pathway some more to see if that enables us to to uh, to have the governance we need of again multiple um, you know the new the new construction or the production part the R and D part and the uh, sustainment all coming together. So so there's a governance part which I think that that pathway will get us to. But again, we're just learning. Um, and then there's a pilot on the R and D. It's it's in the R and D account. But it's called BA8 and it doesn't have the R and D restrictions. So you can use it for uh, for um, modernization, or you can use it for uh, sustainment um, development. As development, shouldn't use that term. Uh, but anyway, uh, so that that all goes together. And then the bigger picture, yes. How do we, as if you're a program manager, how do you um, how do you manage your software and your applications separate from your platforms that they're running on? And that's a a real, I think. Uh, well, a great opportunity. It's a it's something we don't we haven't done, so we got to figure out how to do that. And, and as managers, that's uh, a great learning opportunity for all of us. So we have several faculty that are dying to uh, work on that, and I'm hunting for funding. Uh, <laughs> oh, is that okay? Well, yeah, so we're um, we're, uh, we're ready to go on that. Uh, somebody I, pulls the trigger. I, uh, I think it, I think that's actually an area that will get some funding. So so uh, you know, send that. Send those ideas over. We'll, we'll see what we can do with that. Well, we will. Uh, question from Mike Good, somebody you might know. Hey, Mike. Uh, uh, I completely agree that we need to put increased focus on sustainment. The total ownership cost uh, initiative of some years ago tried to encourage that, but there seemed to be a bit of a lot of barriers in an acquisition program manager making decisions that might cost a bit more in SCN shipbuilding in order to deliver the larger payoff in sustainment. What new policies or encouragement could you suggest to improve our past experience with the talk effort? Yes, yeah, so I'm like, well, was, that, was I one of those program managers? That, that you were. I was too. <laughs> <laughs> um, In the so, end, everything is your fault. You know that, right? So, exactly. So, um, no, good question. And, and actually, uh, I, I would say that's probably the one thing I've seen the last two or three years is a real shift frankly, in the leadership of the Navy and the Marine Corps um, and, and at DOD, you know, as a whole in, uh, in, in thinking about um, sustainment and how we're going to sustain a product as up, up front or earlier, at least, maybe not all the way up front, but earlier, and then giving it the attention it, it needs uh, and, and keeping that attention on sustainment as the pressure of a normal um, acquisition program, those pressures, you know, start to, to mount. Um, process wise, uh, we've created, uh, the, you know, the, there's the six gate review process, gates one through six. We've created a seventh gate, a sustainment gate, where, where the, uh, the CNO and the commandant, uh, or the CNO and the ACMAC and I uh, can review the sustainment uh, of a program. Um, and then in gate six, which is typically the, uh, that kind of, while you're in production, but you're just starting to get into the into the fielding and the fleet, those gates, we've added a sustainment section to it. Um, for those who recognize the, the, the governance document for a program manager is an APB, an acquisition program baseline, which, uh, which actually lays out for the acquisition program manager, the uh, cost, the schedule, and the performance that, that he has to manage within the, and, and provides the thresholds and objectives in there. We have create, or we are in the process of creating uh, sustainment program baselines. Same idea, let's lay out the, here are the sustainment requirements. Here's the money that's going to cost, and here's the uh, the schedule to get you know to get that work done. 
and uh, and trying to get you know the, whether the requirement is an airplane with a mission capable rate, and we're going to use that as a requirement, or you have to develop something like that for ships and for uh, vehicles. But that that's another way that we are highlighting and emphasizing the uh, the need for sustainment to be considered. Uh, at leadership level and reviewed at the leadership level. At the overall budget level, uh, you may be hearing the CNO uh, actually talks a lot, the Commandant, um, some about uh, a balanced budget, a balanced fleet. And, uh, and we don't wanna have a hollow force. So buying ships and, and you know, ship count and all that, well, that's important. Uh, it's not a, it, it doesn't work if we can't sustain those ships or those airplanes. So um, people talk about well, the 355 Navy and all that. Well, that has to, what we, what we are saying to uh, Secretary of Defense's office and to the, to the Hill is uh, whatever the number of ships we have or the number of airplanes we have, we have to increase the sustainment accounts so that we are able to sustain what we have. And so we actually are, are building up the number of ships and airplanes slower because we are making sure that the O&M, the sustainment money is, is in the budget to match, which frankly did not happen in the past. As we get into the pressurized situation financially, we'll see if it stays, but that's where we are now. Well, I remember, uh, I think we worked on, uh, I'll use the old word, a float forward staging base, AFSB, I think it's an ES, ESB or something now. ESB, yeah. Um, where there was a demand for more stuff for sustainment. Uh, since it was an auxiliary, there was no money. And uh, what happened is uh, we negotiated some, uh, I would say margin improvements. Uh, we did things in construction that were good to do in construction and hard to do in sustainment. Uh, more fire main, uh, mm -hmm. thicker steel and stuff like that. So that later on, things could be done in the sustainment phase that would not cost as much. Uh, foundations for cranes, but no cranes that were added later. Mm -hmm. uh, there was margin put into the ship, which you can do, it's hard to do in sustainment. So it was sort of a look ahead build uh, with the things you could do in construction. And that seems to have worked out pretty well from what I could tell. So. Yeah, that's, a, that's another great example. Um, and maybe you were teeing it up for maybe you maybe you weren't, but our, our new program, uh, well, uh, our new in the shipbuilding world, our, our new just uh, starting production design uh, frigate program, we actually consciously put extra space, extra uh, weight margins in there for future growth, for uh, for the DD the DDGX we're calling it the the program that's uh, we're just starting the design of now. Um, that's actually. I mean, even started in 22, we're going to start the design up that comes after DG51. That's one of the, the key tenants is how do I, how do, not only do I leave space and services and foundations and things like that up front, design the ship with extra, maybe a little bigger ship than it needs to be, mm -hmm. but so that it, it can, it has the ability to have that growth. But then also uh, putting in, um, you know, paths or, or designing the ship in a way that that uh, upgrades to systems can be done easily and, and targeting, truly targeting, hey, in a four month availability or a five month availability, I wanna change out the entire combat system yep. as an example. How do I do that? Well, I gotta design the ship differently upfront. Yep. And yes, that makes that requires more design upfront, so more money upfront in design, and it requires frankly a larger ship. So you're gonna pay for, you're gonna pay more for the ship itself. Yeah. But in the end, you should be able to do those upgrades much, much faster. Not that DG 51s aren't great ships, they're awesome ships. But getting them upgraded takes, as people know, a very long time because they weren't built to be upgraded. And so yeah. that's what we that's what we need to do here. That's good to hear. That's that's good. Good luck with um, the naval um, architects on that one. Yeah, uh, on the on the aviation side, uh, haven't cracked that nut yet, but we're gonna we're gonna start working on the aviation side as well. Okay, so I have a question from Haley Chen. Uh, there is much focus on OEM digital engineering. However, Navy is also leveraging physical test sites and working to tie in contractor digital engineering techniques, technologies and models with the physical test sites. Is this a continued plan to support both acquisition and sustainment phases or is the focus going primarily with digital engineering? No, I think I think we always have to have the, uh, the real, you will the real, real, real testing, uh, real, real test facilities, real training on uh, real aircraft, uh, whether it's maintenance or, or uh, operations. So I, I think it always will be a blend of, um, of both digital and um, you know actual hands-on on training. Um, 
the shift will go more and more toward digital, but I don't think it'll ever go 100% digital. I just, I can't see that happening. Uh, maybe just because we're humans, we, 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 we actually want to touch the thing we're operating and, and what we're maintaining. Uh, plus, plus a model, models are only so good, right? That's one of the issues with models. They're only as good as, as the modelers. And so until you actually get the hands-on with the real product, you can't get to that uh, total, total understanding. So I, I, I expect it'll move more, but it will never go to 100% digital. Yeah. So my expectation. Uh, one of the nice things about this job is I get to hang out with scientists and uh, see how things work on that side of things. And uh, Richard Hamming, uh, since passed away, is, uh, has been a prom was a prominent uh, Bell Lab scientist. He came here after he retired from Bell Labs, and he pointed out that science used to be all experiments and a few models. And he says in the 1980s and 90s, it switched to all models and a few experiments. Because uh, the modeling got so much better, you could model it and then you did a real experiment for the things that didn't quite work out in the model. And I, and I think uh, that's where that question was going. Is okay, so that so, right so on, the, on the upfront side, right? Now I, so I, I, went, I went a different way, but on that way, I totally agree, right? Like one thing you're familiar with shock trials. Yes. Yeah, we still got to blow up a ship or two to make sure that, that the uh, model uh, is valid before we can go to 100% uh, modeling. I know you're nodding your head no, but you got to do it once in a while just to prove the model's still good. So we got a clarification from Pamela Kowal Swartout that there are, in fact, five Navy programs in the uh, software. Uh, Thank you. Uh, AD program. And, uh, five out of 5,000. We're getting there. Yes. <laughs> well, I think it's 60. I know there's 16 across the department, and Navy has five of them. So in POC4I and in uh, POMLB. So yep. uh, we're, uh, we're an active participant in that. Uh, Next question is, uh, any chance of sending more civilian, acquisition civilians to NPS, either distance learning or in person uh, in acquisition fields, programming and financial management and that, uh, and that sort of stuff. Any thought of that? Uh, yeah, and obviously once COVID kind of lets up a little bit, uh, but if it's virtual, yes. Uh, actually virtual should make it easier for us to send more acquisition uh, personnel. So, so I'll work with you, Dave, on figuring out how to do that. That's, okay. That's something I really do want to, Okay, uh, here's a question from John Roby. Uh, how do we envision APBs to be used for software pathway programs where agile development leads to more fluid prioritization of capability delivery based on user demand, changing requirements, cybersecurity, et cetera, that may drive varying funding levels? So I think he's looking for a yeah. little leeway in yeah. the process. Yeah, so does the, does the traditional APB apply to something in the, in the software yeah. uh, pathway? Yeah. And the answer is no, it doesn't, right? <laughs> um, so that's part of that, like I said, we have to learn. I think we only have one program, you know, official program in that software pathway within, within the Navy. I'm sure the Air Force and the Army have others. Um, there has to be some sort of governance uh, uh, document for the program manager and the, and the requirements team to use. Uh, but it can't be the detailed document that an APP is. And so what does that look like? Uh, I think it's going to be uh, general, like top level requirements yeah. and a general level of funding. And then saying there's a governance team that, you know, two times a year, three times a year gets together and adjusts as we go and, and you know, puts out new software updates, whatever the right you know, periodicity is, not the two or three year cycle that we're in today. Yeah. Um, so, Will there be nothing? No, there, will, there has to be some overall go governance uh, document, but I think it is um, it's much more general in, it, in, uh, in the requirements and it's, and it's more a pot of money versus, versus you know, explicit you know, 38 line items within a single program. It just has to be. Now, is Congress gonna accept that when we put that in a budget exhibit? Who knows, we'll get there. But, uh, well, we're happy to help you with that. Uh, unfortunately, okay. we run out of time. I have uh, six more questions stacked up, but uh, we'll not be able to get to them. Uh, I, I do want to say that uh, thank you for your time. And, uh, and I would give you the award for getting the hardest hitting questions that we've ever had. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you fielded them well. Uh, but, uh, but this was a pew, 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 pew kind of question and answer session. So you, you did well. Well, and, and I'd like to thank the observers, the audience, uh, for asking those hard-hitting questions. That's uh, that's great on you. 
you. And, uh, and that's how we all learn, uh, both in the asking and uh, in the answering. So, uh, so uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Stephanie, for your time. Uh, and uh, appreciate your support of this symposium. Uh, I'll get the rest of the questions and get them to you just so you know uh, what, you, what you didn't have to answer. I didn't have to do. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that'll get me warmed up for the congressional uh, hearings that I have to go to. There you go. There so, you go. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, all right. Uh, it was a great, Dave, and I appreciate it. And for all those out there in video, uh, hopefully next year we can do it in person. Look forward to it. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Thank you very much.